Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to prove a couple of important results relating to the dot product or the scalar product of two vectors in three-dimensional space. The first result is going to be the fact that the dot product is basis independent. In other words, regardless of how you choose your x, y, and z axes in 3D space, you will get the same result if you evaluate the dot product. Now, the second part of the video is going to be about proving the equivalence of the two forms of the dot product that I've written up at the top here. So we've got the first form, which is for two vectors u and v, the dot product is ux vx plus uy vy plus uz vz, um, where these individual numbers are just the x, y, and z components of u and v. And the second form is the one on the right there, um, which is the modulus or magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times the cosine of the angle between them. Now, if you've studied physics or maths to a reasonably advanced level, you will no doubt have come across both of these forms before, but what you may or may not have thought about is why they're actually equivalent to each other. So that's what I'm going to show in the second part of the video. Now, if we start by proving the basis independence of the dot product, what I'm going to do is take the two vectors u and v and rotate them, right, which is equivalent to doing a rotation of, um, of your x, y, and z axes, right? So if we rotate our axes, um, then u and v are going to be modified by the same rotation matrix, right? So we can represent a rotation using a rotation matrix, and I'm going to call that general rotation matrix R, right? And let's think about what happens if you take the dot product of R times the vector u um, and R times the vector v, right? So this is like the uh, the new rotated u dotted with the new rotated v. Now note that we don't have to consider what happens if we do a translation of the um, of the basis. In other words, if we just shift its origin, because well, if you think about the interpretation of a three D vector as like an arrow in three D space, um, if you just move your um, your coordinate system without rotating it, in other words, if you translate it, that's not going to change the individual components of the vectors, and so um, that's kind of, uh, well, the dot product is kind of trivially invariant under translation. So we've just got to consider what happens when you rotate um, the, the basis, because that's a bit less obvious. Now, what I'm going to do to prove that this is actually the same as u dot v is use suffix notation, um, which is, well, a very powerful way of dealing with this, this kind of calculation. Um, now, Okay, what we can do is say that uh, the dot product is defined in the following way. It is the rotation matrix R times U, the ith component of that, um, multiplied by uh, the rotation matrix times the vector V, and then the ith component of that. And I'm going to use the Einstein summation convention. In other words, summation is assumed over repeated indices, right? So this is like the x component of this thing times the x component of that thing, plus the y component of the first one times the y component of the second one, plus the same for the z components. Okay, so um, then what we have to do is try and write these multiplications between matrices and vectors in terms of, well, in, in suffix notation as well. Fortunately, um, there is an easy way to do that, because the ith component of this vector r u is actually just um, r i j times u j. Okay, again, I'm not intending this to be a full introduction to suffix notation, um, so if you're not familiar with how this works, you may want to do some reading up on that first. Um, but this is like a general result. Uh, the, the ith component of r times u is given by um, this expression here, where we're summing over the index j. Now, um, we can do a similar thing for the second vector rv. I'm going to write that as r um, i k times v k. I'm not using j this time because we've already used up the j's, right? So this is like we're summing over a different index here. Okay, uh, now what I'm going to do is kind of regroup the terms, right? I'm going to say this is the same as r i j r i k times u j times v k. OK, um, we're free to do that because, well, the order of multiplication doesn't matter because all of these individual numbers are just scalars, right? So we can multiply them together in any order we want, and then we just sum over the indices after we do that. Um, OK, 
the next step is going to be relating to that first term, r i j. I'm going to write that as the transpose of r, right? Remember, r is a matrix, the transpose of r, and then the j i component of that vector, right? Because if we transpose a matrix, we just kind of flip the, the rows and the columns. And so we can transpose it and then flip the indices. So that's r transpose j i times r i k and then times u j times v k. All right. Um, but if you're familiar with, with suffix notation, you might recognize this as just the j k component of r t times r, right? Because we're summing over this um, kind of inner index i. These first two terms are basically just a matrix multiplication. And we can group them together in the following way as r t times r, but then the j k component of that, right? And then we've still got our u j v k at the end there. So here is where we actually make use of, of, a, of a, an important property of rotation matrices, which is that they're orthogonal, right? So I'm not going to prove this result um, here, but it is a general fact that any rotation matrix is orthogonal, um, which just means that if you take uh, the transpose of the rotation matrix and multiply it by the matrix itself, you get the identity matrix. In other words, the transpose of the matrix is the same as its inverse. So RT times R is actually the identity matrix. And therefore, I can replace the JK component of RT times R um, with a Kronecker delta, um, which basically gives the components of the identity matrix and write that as delta JK times UJ times VK where um, this Kronecker delta is equal to one if the indices are the same and zero if the indices are different. And so what the Kronecker delta basically does is it forces the indices to be the same, right? Because it's zero if they're not. So I can rewrite that as just uj times vj because, well, for any terms where j is not equal to k, the delta term is just, is just zero, right? So we only have to consider the terms where j equals k. And so we can just write, um, well, this k as a j, right? But remembering that summation is assumed over repeated indices, this is actually the same thing as ux vx plus uy vy um, plus uz vz, which is exactly the definition of the dot product, right? So this is the same as u dotted with v. In other words, if you rotate them both, or equivalently, if you rotate your basis, then um, the value of the dot product doesn't change. So we've shown that the dot product is basis independent. Okay, now what we're going to do is show why the component wise definition of the dot product is the same as this definition in terms of the, the magnitudes of the vectors and the cosine of the angle between them. Um, and we're going to, the reason I'm doing this now is that it relies on this basis independence, or at least the, the derivation I'm going to do relies on the result that we've just um, proved. So to help out with this, I'm going to start by just drawing a little diagram of our two vectors. So let's say um, that's going to be our u vector, and this is going to be our v vector. Um, so let me just label those. There's u, there's v, and theta, by definition, is the angle in between them. OK. So what we can do is evaluate the dot product in component-wise form in a very particular choice of basis, because we're allowed to evaluate it in whatever basis we want, because we've just shown that you'll get the same result, right? So what I'm going to do is choose the most convenient basis of all. Uh, let me just write this out. So choose a basis um, in which the x-axis is actually aligned with the vector u, right? So in which the x-axis is aligned um, with this u vector. OK, now what that implies is with this special choice of basis, the y component and the z component of u are both zero, OK, which is going to simplify the calculation a lot because that implies that u dotted with v is just ux times vx, right? Because the y and z contributions to the dot product are just zero. Um, all right, now because we've chosen the x axis to be aligned with the u vector, the x component of u is actually just the same as the magnitude of u, right? So I can, instead of ux, I can write the magnitude of u. Um, and then let's just keep that v, the x component of v, as it is for now. Then all we have to do is a bit of basic trick, right? Because if I um, 
just draw a dashed line here, we have a little right angle triangle. Here's a right angle there. And the x component of v is just going to be the component of v which is aligned with u because we've chosen our x-axis to be aligned with u, right? And so we're basically after this distance there. But just from uh, trigonometry, that's the same as the magnitude of v times the cosine of theta, right? Because the length of this hypotenuse of the triangle is the magnitude of v. So this is actually equal, this dot product is actually magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times the cosine of theta. And so we've shown um, that u dotted with v is equal to modulus of u times the modulus of v times the cosine of theta in this particular frame, but because it's basis independent, we now know that this is true regardless of your basis, right? So we've shown that this is true in all, um, in all bases. And so there you go. That is why these two definitions of the dot product are in fact equivalent.